Thank you all for being here. It's my pleasure to be up here. My name is Elizabeth Strahalski, and I'm one of the newest program managers in DARPA's BTO. If we want to get serious about engineering with biology as a technology, it's time that we figure out how to engineer in control. One of the things that I like to do with my time at DARPA is to figure out how to take the complexity that's inherent to biology from something we think of as a problem to something we think of as a tool for control. Now, I'm trained as a physicist. And so the first kind of question I want to ask is, how can we control cells in the same way that we control electrons and photons? What capabilities do we need to build in order to make this a reality? And in fact, why can't we do this already? And the answer, of course, is that cells aren't electrons and photons. Physics and engineering have done an amazing job of teaching us how to build very complicated systems where we understand all the individual parts and we know how to put them together in ways that are generally very simple and hierarchical. But biology is a lot more complex than that. And I believe that this complexity is at the heart of what makes biology so compelling as a potential technology in the first place. Properties like reproduction, adaptation, sensing. If we really want to make these work for us, I think that we need to figure out how they're rooted in complexity so that we can control it. Now, when I talk about the complexity of biology, I'm referring to the way in which it spans many scales of space and time, all the way from molecules up to ecosystems, and all the way from cells talking to each other to evolution. And these different scales interact with one another in ways that are interdependent and can even give rise to emergent or collective behavior. This is what makes biology so difficult to control and engineer with. And the way in which we've tried to do this so far reminds me a lot of my time in high energy physics. At the Tevatron, I helped to collide protons and antiprotons to build up interaction maps where we would find things like a top quark, for example. In biology, we break open cells to do omics measurements, to, to catalog all the different molecules that are inside. And we build up interaction maps, for example, showing all the different genes a particular protein and yeast interacts with. The difference between these two, though, is that in the physics case, we have a theory called the standard model that tells us which subatomic particles we should expect to find and the relationships between them. We don't have that for biology. And it's worse than that, because if I want to understand not subatomic particles, but the chairs you're all sitting on, I'm not going to go to the standard model. I'm going to go to a different theory for that scale, something like solid state physics. The point being that for you know, in engineering and physics, we have different theories at different scales, and we know how to put those theories to work for us in a way that gives us control and understanding across scales. This is what is missing from biology. And it's a problem because in nearly every system, at every scale where we've tried to engineer with biology, we come up against roadblocks put in place by that complexity. So much so that our strategy for dealing with this has largely been to try to engineer out the complexity, to try to go around it somehow, or more often than not, just ignore it. <laughs> and I don't mean to just pick on the biologists. <laughs> the physicists and engineers have been guilty as well, although those fields are starting to make some progress in understanding and using complexity, for example, in quantum physics, in software design, in control theory. And not only that, these other fields can give us a roadmap that I think we can use for pushing forward with engineering biology. And this is a roadmap that has been used in non-biological contexts again and again. And it's one that can take us from the descriptive science that biology is largely now, all the way to applications that matter in our lives. To give you an example of what this might look like, let's consider technologies we're all familiar with, like the laser, LEDs, and radiation therapies. What you may not know is that these have their roots in the late 1800s and early 1900s when we were trying to figure out what sunlight was made of. We had new measurement technologies then that showed us a complicated spectrum of emission wavelengths, and we had no idea how to predict what those were or where they came from. But what we didn't know how to do was to look to a much simpler model system, in this case, hydrogen gas. It has four emission wavelengths in the visible. 
which made it much easier for us to write down empirical formulas that tell us how to predict what wavelengths we should find. And then we could look to this newfangled quantum hypothesis to build up a new conceptual model of an atom that tells us why we should expect those wavelengths. So the idea is to use this simple model system to develop rules for understanding that we can map back onto the more complicated system to develop control that forms the basis for these technologies. This can work for biology, but how? And you know, some folks are starting to work in these areas here and there, but it's not enough. We have to do more. And we can start by focusing in on the small scales from biomolecules up to cells. And this is a great place to start because something truly remarkable happens at these scales with stunning regularity. And this is that transition from systems that don't have the properties of being alive to systems that do. Think about it. So there's this compelling fundamental reason to start there. But we also have all these new technologies coming online that make these scales some of the most technologically accessible. Technologies like additive manufacturing and tissue engineering, like cellular and viral synthetic biology, like those omics measurements we talked about, as well as fluidics technologies, and all of the things we can build at the nanometer and micrometer scales that can also give us ways of measuring what's happening in these systems. So we can use these technologies to build top-down and bottom-up models and measurements that help us bracket these scales in space and time and complexity so that we can take what comes from those models and figure out simple, predictive, quantitative rules. To give us an idea for what these rules might look like, let's consider what it took to get us to the moon. This really started back in Tycho Brahe's very careful tables of the movements of celestial objects. And this is sort of where biology is at now. And it's not enough. We needed Kepler to come and give us his empirical laws of planetary motion that Newton then refined into his laws of motion. That's what we need for biology. And a lot of folks might tell you that they think these don't exist for biology, or that if they do exist, they're impossible to find. And that's pretty much catnip for DARPA. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you that these rules are all around us if we only have eyes to see. Consider, for example, the central dogma of biology, where DNA is transcribed into RNA, translated into protein. So this is at the molecular scale, but at larger scales we see this too, where, for example, we have slime molds that create collectively these networks to move resources that look a lot like the networks we make, for example, in our interstate system. So the rules are there. And our challenge is then to figure out how to use those rules to implement control. And this is important because any application we want to work towards will require control. And we're lucky because we can build on the control strategies we have already working for us in industries like aviation and electronics. What we need to do, though, is adapt these control theories to incorporate the nonlinearities, dynamics, and complexity inherent to biology. And once we have that, we can build controllers that we integrate directly into biology that propagate with it, but still allow us to reach in and, and dynamically control what that system is doing. So in this way, I think that we can go from the descriptive science biology is now all the way to applications that matter for our lives. The idea is to take this narrow window where we've had success in engineering with biology and really blow open the possibilities. But we need control for that. And we need this kind of a systems-focused approach across scale that works with the complexity of biology so that we can control cells the way we control electrons and photons. And once we do this for these small scales, let's scale it up so that we're managing our internal and our external environments locally, as well as making sure that all of our needs are met globally for food, clean air, clean water. Because I know that with my time at DARPA, I want to make sure that when we're engineering with biology as a technology at any scale, no matter how complex, that we're the ones in control. Thanks very much. <laughs>